This week I came across a website called uh, for the organization One for Israel. And I don't know that I was familiar with that organization before, but it was super encouraging to come across that website. The reason why it was so encouraging is because I came to this testimonial page. And on this testimonial page, I saw lots and lots of these videos uh, entitled, I Met Messiah. Now, One for Israel is a Messianic Jewish organization, which means these are, it's an organization by and for people who are biological descendants of Abraham, who have come to understand the truth that Jesus is the Messiah. And this testimonial page was super powerful because just story after story of people who've come to realize that Jesus is the Messiah. And there were all different kinds of stories up there. You can see from sort of the titles they put up there, you can get the idea. Uh, I, I watched one where somebody was a drug dealer. I watched one where uh, just this woman, her husband left her. And that was part of the means that Jesus used uh, to bring her to faith in him. There were stories of uh, people who were in influential academics, just ordinary people, mostly Jewish people, but also there was a story of a man, an Iranian, who grew up hating Jews, who came to believe and to understand that Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior, not just of the Jewish people, but of all people. And I watched some of the videos, just tears in my eyes, just rejoicing that God had done something so powerful in these people's lives. It's entitled, I Met Messiah. That's the name of the sort of the page. Messiah is a word that means savior. It means rescuer. Especially, first and foremost, it is pointing to Jesus, the Messiah. We're about to begin or embark on the study of a book that we call the Gospel of Matthew, but that entitles itself, or the first line of the book is, the genesis or the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah. And if we had to sort of say, okay, look, we're about to embark on the Gospel of Matthew, which is the first book in the New Testament, which is really means that as Matthew opens, it is the dawning of Christianity. If we lay aside all the theological debates, the questions, the discussions, the apologetics, all of that stuff, if we boil the message of Christianity down to its absolute simplest form, it's that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Savior of the world. That instead of God choosing to condemn the world, he decided to try to save it. And that these people's stories of meeting Messiah is individual stories of what Christianity is about, which is Jesus coming to save, coming to fix, coming to restore, coming to bless. Well, this morning we have the opportunity to be reminded that is the essence of what it means to be a Christian. Christian, the word Christ is just the Greek word for Messiah. So to be a Christian is to be a believer in Jesus as Savior. Jesus as rescuer. Jesus is the one who helps us. So this morning, let me invite you to take a Bible and turn to the opening of the New Testament, the opening of the Christian story, the very first book in the second half of the Bible, the book of Matthew. If you don't have a Bible with you, we believe so much that this is God's Word that we provide Bibles for you to use. There should be one in the rack in front of you. And if you turn to page 783 in those Bibles, you will be at the Gospel of Matthew. You'll see a blank page before in which it says the New Testament or the New Covenant. This is the second half of the Bible and it is the opening of the Christian story. And what we have in Matthew's gospel is the very first line of the gospel of Matthew, the very first line of the New Testament, the very first line in the beginning of Christianity. And it starts with, this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah. And then what follows is a bunch of names. And you might be thinking, what a boring way to start a book. 
Like billions of people who believe who are Christians, billions of people, and this is how the thing starts? With a whole bunch of names? I will grant you that. It is an odd way to start a book. But if you're willing to think about this for a moment, it's actually a really powerful way to start a book. Because while you do have a bunch of names here, if you think of these names like sort of hyperlinks, it's like they're sort of stories of actual individuals who are connected to Jesus. And that if we had the time, we could go through each one of these names. These are real people. And they had real struggles. And they had real issues. And they had real needs. And what you actually have here is a list of people for whom God did something powerful and amazing. And so what I'd like to do this morning is I would like to think of this list a little bit like that One for Israel website that there are particular stories in here that if we had a video camera and we could record them, we could simply click on the links and hear the stories that are represented in this thumbnail sketch. So what we're going to do this morning, we don't have time to tell all of the stories, so I'm going to tell seven of them. Seven stories from this list so that you can see that what's going on in Matthew, that Matthew opens with stories, stories of God at work in people's lives, rescuing, blessing, and helping. Now, how do we come up with the seven? How do we pick these seven? Well, like when I went to that When for Israel website, there were too many testimonies to watch this week. So what I did is I kind of just kind of glanced through and looked for the ones I thought had the most kind of interesting titles on them. The same thing actually happens when you look in Matthew's gospel. If you look in Matthew's gospel, there's tons of names here, but there's a couple of things that the Holy Spirit has done to highlight some of the names, meaning that, believe it or not, this is not a web page. It is actually a genealogy, and genealogies follow a normal formula. So-and-so was the father of so Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac was the father of Jacob. But in this genealogy, there are seven places where we get some extra words, where it doesn't follow the exact formula. So for me this week, I kind of clicked on those seven, and those are the stories we have up here. And so I would just like to share those stories with you, and hopefully we will get a picture together of what it means that Jesus is Messiah, that Jesus is Savior. So the first story is in verse 2. It starts, Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob. Now what we would expect next is simply the line, Jacob was the father of Judah, period. But what we get is Jacob was the father of Judah, and then we get this little phrase, and his brothers. So if we clicked on that link, we have the opportunity to think about the story of Jacob. Now some of you were with us as we went through the book of Genesis and we saw Jacob's story in great detail. Some of you may not have been here for that. Let me quickly summarize Jacob's story for us. Jacob was born into a dysfunctional family. His dad liked his twin brother Esau a lot better than he liked Jacob. Jacob's mom liked him better than she liked Esau. It's bad to grow up in a dysfunctional family where there is favoritism like that. Between the two of them, there's just the two twin boys, Jacob and Esau. Esau's older, Jacob's younger. And Jacob is the weaker, scheming, younger brother. Esau is the stronger, older, more powerful brother. Well, Jacob resorts to his scheming ways, and he actually cheats Esau out of something he is due. And Esau gets furious with Jacob and threatens to kill him when their father dies. Well, Jacob runs for his life, and he goes to live with his uncle. But it's sort of out of the frying pan into the fire. He left one dysfunctional family for an even more dysfunctional family. And so Jacob goes to work for his uncle, who cheats him every different way you can be cheated. Along the way, Jacob gets attracted to a girl, Rachel, and wants to marry her. But somehow in his sort of powerlessness, remember he's the weaker brother, somehow in his powerlessness, he does end up married to that girl, but also three other women 
at the same time. And he effectively ends up with four wives, all of whom are running his life in a way that he seems to have no control over. And again, not only is his birth family dysfunctional, his adopted family dysfunctional, but also his own family dysfunctional. That the interactions of these various wives with Jacob, he's powerless in his interactions, even with his own children when his daughter is sexually assaulted. Jacob's immobilized. He doesn't know what to do. He feels powerless and does nothing. He just ignores it. He just ignores that it happened. His oldest son sleeps with one of his wives. The next two go on a massive slaughter, like a shooting spree, to kill the people who sexually assaulted their sister and gets Jacob in trouble with all of the neighboring clans. He's powerless, surrounded by dysfunction all around him. But the crazy thing, it says here, Jacob, the father of Judah, and his brothers. Here's a guy who is powerless, yet God in his mercy gives to Jacob the surest sign of strength in that culture. He gives him sons. Not just one or two or three, 12 12 sons. This is God showing up to a man who has no power of his own and giving to him signs of strength. And our first story is a reminder that God loves to save those who feel powerless in dysfunctional families. Our second story is just the very next line of the next verse. It says, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah whose mother was Tamar. In this era, you didn't often get females in genealogy, so I'm interested in that story, so we're going to click on her story. Tamar marries Judah's oldest son. The problem is, he was extremely wicked, and so God put him to death. So by culture... Tamar is bound to marry the next son. So she marries Judah's second oldest son. Unfortunately, he too was wicked, unfaithful to the Lord, and unfaithful to his wife. And so God put him to death. Well, now Tamar's stuck. By culture and tradition, she is bound to marry Judah's third son, but he's young. So Judah promises, hey, look, you're gonna, we can't marry him off now. When he grows up, then I will let you marry him. And so Tamar waits as she herself gets older. She's not married. She's got no children. Well, Judah is lying to her. He's unfaithful to her as well. He refuses. He's already lost two sons. He refuses to give the third. And so now Tamar is completely stuck. She can't marry somebody else. She's got no kids. She's got no hope. And then unfortunately, in this story, Tamar, contaminated by the unfaithfulness of her two husbands and of her father-in-law, she resorts to her own form of unfaithfulness. And she disguises herself as a prostitute and tricks Judah into sleeping with her. Judah himself, this is his own great sin, but remember, this is Tamar's story and not Judah's. But in Tamar's, she succumbs to the unfaithful pattern that has been set for her. But crazily enough, in the midst of all this unfaithfulness, God shows himself to be faithful. And he gives to Tamar twins, Perez and Zerah. And his gift to Tamar is not just these boys, but one of these boys, Perez, gets to be the descendant through whom the Messiah will come. God loves to save those who have been both the victim and the perpetrator of unfaithfulness. Third story is down in verse 5. In between verse 3 and 5, we have just kind of the normal formula. Those stories are interesting too. We just don't have time to go through them all this morning. But in verse 5, it says, Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. 
That's intriguing to me. If we were to gonna click on that story, <clears throat> I kind of picture in my mind, uh, you know, Rahab being asked to go on camera, tell us your story. I think the opening line of her story would be, I'm not Jewish. This is strange, it's unexpected. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Jewish Messiah. But yes, you're reading through this list and all of a sudden here comes Rahab and she is most definitely not Jewish. She is not a descendant of Abraham. She is a Canaanite, which means she is part of the people living in the land that Israel will end up getting who are so wicked that God decides to raise up Israel as a nation to get rid of the Canaanites. They are incredibly wicked. And Rahab is part of that group. She is effectively, by her nationality, part of the enemies of God. More than that, Rahab is a prostitute, which means that she is actively involved in the kind of activity that's caused God to be so angry with the Canaanites in the first place. And so she has made herself into God's enemy, both by ethnicity and by behavior. But the amazing thing about Rahab, and I kind of picture this in my mind, I see like an older woman and we've got the camera and we're asking her, tell us your story. And I'm sure she's telling the story about how, look, I didn't even know who these Jewish people were. I didn't know anything about Abraham. I was busy living my life and all of a sudden I heard that there was this invading army and they were coming to take over this land and they were gonna kill all of us. And then she's gonna tell you a story about a couple of spies. And I kind of picture Rahab as an older woman looking back and I kind of see the, the smile on her face. And I see her saying, they were supposed to be spies, but they weren't there for spying. They were there to save. They were there to rescue me. And she would be right. The two spies that the leader of Israel sends into the land that end up meeting Rahab have got to be the worst spies in the history of spying. <laughs> They're horrendous. They gather no useful information from their spying. They're not even consulted. They're supposed to be spying so that they can figure out what a good military strategy would be. They give no advice on what military strategy should be. And worst of all, they're supposed to be spies. As soon as they show up in the city, every single person, including the king, knows that they're there and that they're spies. And you think, how bad at your job do you have to be to do this? But they're not there for spying. They're there for saving. And God is effectively through them offering to the entire city, all of his enemies, who would like to come and join the people of God. Rahab is the only one in her family who respond. But I can see her telling her story and saying, I was his enemy. And he sent these two people to come find me. And he saved me. And Rahab, a Canaanite, a prostitute, is listed here in the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah. Because God loves to save his enemies. The next story is right below it. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Again, another female, that intrigues me. And it doesn't follow the particular formula. So again, if we click on this link and we want to hear Ruth's story. Now, some of you may be familiar with Ruth's story. It is told in the Bible in a book named after her, Ruth. I'm familiar with that story, but while I was studying it this week, I had an aha moment. One of those things that I'm like, well, I probably should have known this and maybe I did, but it never really dawned on me until I looked at it afresh this time. My aha moment was, is okay, I know the story of Ruth and I know the answer to the question, who is Ruth's mother-in-law, is Naomi. That's who the mother-in-law in the story is. But looking at it again, I realized Ruth has another mother-in-law. What's Ruth's other mother-in-law's name? It's Rahab. Rahab. 
That's her mother-in-law. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with this story, Ruth is also not Jewish. She's from Moab. She marries a Jewish man who has left Israel because of a famine to go live in Moab, meets Ruth, they get married, and they're living uh, in Moabite territory. The husband's mom, her name is Naomi. She is Jewish. The husband who Ruth married, he dies and leaves Ruth as a widow, uh, as a young widow, trying to make it in life. Ruth has a strong connection to Naomi, but at some point Naomi hears that the famine in Israel where she's from has begun to lessen, and so she decides she wants to move home. She's like, life's not going well for me in Moab. Both of her sons died and her husband died. She is left without anybody meaningful in her family except for two daughters-in-law. And so she says, I'm moving back to Israel. The two daughters-in-law's daughters-in-law say they're going to go. One ends up not going, and Ruth says, hey, look, you can't get rid of me. And so they move back to Israel, and Ruth is a foreigner coming to live in the land, but she's got no money. She's destitute. She's poor. It's like somebody coming to America, perhaps as a refugee, who's got to immediately join welfare. She's got no income and no means of income. And the problem was she's a foreigner and Israel at this time is especially not welcoming to foreigners. But in the midst of this situation, God in his kindness directs Ruth to go work for a man named Boaz. One of the few people in Israel who's actually kind and righteous and good. And now I see God's wisdom, which I had missed it before. Why is Boaz so kind to this foreigner? Because there's one woman in all of Israel who knows what it's like to be a foreigner and come and join these people, and it's his mom. How can God do this? It's amazing. Imagine being a destitute refugee, and you join the one family. In Israel, where your mother-in-law is actually going to understand what you're going through. And so God, in his kindness, both to Boaz and to Ruth, he welcomes her in. He does not treat her as a stranger. He treats her as part of the family. By God's grace, to both Boaz and Ruth, they end up getting married. And Rahab becomes her other mother-in-law. And God's kindness to Ruth is that this woman who's not Jewish, gets the ultimate insider gift from God. She gives birth to Obed, who gives birth to Jesse, who gives birth to King David, who ends up being the ancestor of Jesus, the Messiah. You couldn't have more of an insider legacy than this. And this was God being kind and saving and blessing Ruth a destitute refugee, welcomed into God's family. Our fourth, fifth story is actually verse six. This is with King David. It says, and Jesse, the father of King David, it's interesting, he's the only one who gets called king in here, so that, that's noteworthy. And then we get more. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Now, this sounds salacious to me, so I'm gonna be reading on the website here, and I'm gonna look at the title, and I'm gonna think, all right, I want to hear that story. So you click on the link, and I imagine what happens is I can kind of see David as an older man sort of on camera and ask, tell us about your life. And I imagine David uh, sort of glowing with the Holy Spirit, just full of joy and praise. This is the man who wrote the Psalms, and so I think he's probably speaking in very poetic, musical, beautiful language as he recounts the fact that he used to be just this little shepherd taking care of sheep, and all of a sudden, Samuel shows up and tells him he's going to be the second king of Israel. And I can hear David sort of recalling about the fact that all of Israel was afraid of this giant named Goliath. And so David was asked or volunteered to go and fight Goliath and that God was with him. And he brought about this incredible victory. And I can see David sort of looking back in his mind's eye and recalling these great events and about how, yes, it was difficult being on the run from Saul, but God protected him time and time again and then turned the kingdom over to him. And I can hear David telling the story about how he climbed up the water shaft to take over Jerusalem and to make it a capital city. 
And I can hear it just filled with words from the Psalms as David recounts all that God did for him. But then at some point in my mind's eye on the camera, I see David's face and countenance drop. And I see his eyes look down. And I hear him say, but there were some mistakes along the way too. You see, it says here, David was the father of Solomon whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Uriah is one of David's close friends. Uriah is not a stranger to David. He's one of his mighty men, meaning he is a high-ranking official who is an incredible soldier. In fact, Uriah is one of the most loyal and competent soldiers in David's army, and David knows him well. The problem was is that one day David decided he wanted to sleep with Uriah's wife. He not only did that, he also needed to cover it up, and so he had Uriah murdered. In the history of Israel, this is one of the most dastardly betrayals that you could possibly fathom. David, in every way, disqualified himself from being king and from even being a believer. But God, who is rich in mercy, chose to accept David's confession and he forgave him. And the sign of God's saving power is that this formerly illicit marriage, David with his close friend's wife, they give birth to a son, Solomon. And God chooses to have that son be the next king and the ancestor of Jesus the Messiah. God even saves disqualified believers. Sixth story is in verse 11. Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. Jeconiah is a man who has two names in the Bible, and so sometimes we miss him because one name is being used and we're looking for the other. He's often called Jeconiah, as he is here, or as the footnote says, he also is named Jehoiachin. He goes by both of those names. Jehoiachin is king in Israel, but he is a wicked king, meaning he does not follow the ways of his father David. He does not follow the, uh, the pattern that was set for him by the good kings of Judah and Israel that came before him. He actually only gets to be king of Israel for three months. He's so wicked that God raises up Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar to come and invade Israel in part because of Jehoiachin's wickedness, but in part because of his father and the people who came before him, uh, their wickedness. And Nebuchadnezzar comes in, and at first it looks like Jehoiachin is going to submit to the fact that God is doing this through Babylon, but then he turns on Nebuchadnezzar, and Nebuchadnezzar totally and completely destroys him and his power. He takes Jehoiachin and imprisons him in Babylon for 37 years. And then the craziest thing happens. Remember, this is a wicked king. This is not a king who did what he was supposed to do for the three months he was on the throne. After 37 years, God has another king arise in Babylon to take Nebuchadnezzar's place and motivates that king to be kind to Jehoiachin. And that king picks Jehoiachin out of prison. Now there's a whole bunch of other kings in prison of the other nations that Babylon has captured. But God has the new king choose Jehoiachin to, be out, to outrank all of the rest of them. God treats Jehoiachin uh, through Babylon with extreme kindness. The king actually invites the man to eat at his table to basically be part of his sort of extended family. He shows incredible kindness to him, and he gives him a monthly stipend for the rest of his life, all because of God. And we are reminded that God even saves wicked kings. Last story, verse 16. 
And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus who is called the Messiah. Our seventh story is about a pious young teenage girl. She is an observant Jew. She is a good believer in God. She follows all of his ways. And because she does, God asks her, to do one of the most difficult things that any human has ever been asked to do. She is asked to become pregnant with a baby she wasn't planning and didn't ask for outside the boundaries of marriage so that she becomes pregnant without ever having sexual intercourse with the man, but... Only two people know this, her and her fiancé. Everybody else thinks she's been unfaithful. And so Mary, who is asked to do the almost impossible of give birth to the Son of God and raise this child, does so among gossip and slander that she did it in unfaithfulness and sexual immorality. But God's kindness to Mary, Jesus' saving power, is I know she wasn't unfaithful. You know she wasn't unfaithful. The world knows that she wasn't unfaithful. How? Because God told her story. That God saves even those who are wrongly slandered. The crazy thing here is it says, And Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus. The thing that's amazing about this is that all the rest of the genealogy, there are some other women mentioned, but even when other women are mentioned, the man gets the place in the genealogy. But that can't happen with Joseph because Joseph is not actually Jesus' dad. And so the penultimate place in the genealogy, you can almost say the sort of second most important place, the person who is going to be the one through whom the Messiah will come, well, it's not a man's name there. It's Mary's. And that God has chosen to honor her so that all subsequent generations, whenever they think of Jesus, they think of this woman. And we don't think of her as someone who is sexually immoral, somebody who is unfaithful. God has totally and completely vindicated her. Seven stories. All signs of how God rescues, how God saves. Different circumstances, different situations, but the same God bringing salvation and rescue. And these seven stories, the reason why they are the way they are is because they are connected to Jesus, the Messiah. This is supposed to be a sign as Matthew's gospel opens, it is making this one point. Our stories are different because of our connection to Jesus. These are people who came before Jesus. After Jesus, it just explodes as more and more and more stories of their, our connection to Jesus changes our lives. I have my own story. I got the story of God being kind to me in the midst of 10 years of faithlessness and doubt. I got a story of God choosing to requalify me after disqualifying kinds of stuff the kindness and mercy of God I met with a couple last week in 2020 after living their own lives racking up felonies and doing all sorts of difficult things God got a hold of their life and completely transformed them and changed their story on my desk downstairs I got a printed testimony of the new president about the new president of the University of Michigan who is a Christian reading about Queen Elizabeth and talking about Queen Elizabeth this week, her story of how God saved her and rescued her. 
I was sent a testimony uh, four or five weeks ago, 27 pages. I couldn't stop reading it. It was so amazing to hear what God has been doing in a person's life. All because of a connection to Jesus. And so this raises the very simple question. What about you? Billions and billions of people. Some who came before Jesus and were connected to him that way. Billions and billions of people after Jesus have a story. What about you? Do you have a story? And it's all centered around one thing. Whatever the tagline is, I was powerless in a dysfunctional family. I was a foreigner. I was God's enemy. I was the victim of unfaithfulness and I was a perpetrator of unfaithfulness. I betrayed a close friend and murdered him. I was a wicked king for so many years. I was a slandered teenage girl. What does your story say? Because whatever it is at this point, what God wants it to end with is, but Jesus saved me. Jesus rescued me. Jesus helped me. The essence of what it means to be a Christian is you believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is God among us come to save us. And if you believe that, he changes your story forever. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you rewrote my story. It was headed in a very different direction. But because of your kindness and mercy, it has a great ending. God, for people in this room, many of whom have similar but different stories. God, for those we heard today from Matthew, similar but different. Lord, I pray for all who may hear this message, <clears throat> all who may come in contact with Matthew's genealogy. May their lives be changed. God, I can't wait till we get to heaven and get to hear all of the stories and see all of the ways that you are faithful. Jesus, we believe that you are the savior of the world. Would you come into each of our lives and continue to exercise your saving power? For we ask this in your name. Amen.